Okay, thank you everyone for sticking around for our, the, the last uh, wrap-up session. Uh, I'm Hunt Willard from uh, Geisinger National, which is a unit here based in the Washington, D.C. Uh, area uh, belonging to the Geisinger Health System, which is up in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, we're charged in this session, uh, brief as it may be, um, to sort of reflect on everything we've heard about over the last eight hours. Um, and um, I'm uh, shortly going to be asking each of the uh, panelists to sort of pick their either high or low light, uh, the most impressive um, bit of information they've heard about today, or um, uh, to begin to direct us um, as we move forward. Uh, the, the very uh, ambitious goal for the session, uh, and if, it, if I knew it would only take 30 seconds to actually solve this problem, we'd be all set, which is how can consumer genomics be better integrated to improve health? Um, that sounds like a lifetime of work, but we'll do it in 30 seconds. Um, and then really what it is is to allow us to reflect on everything we've talked about today, which will inform what the uh, roundtable will talk about tomorrow um, as we reflect on it and try to pull this into actionable um, uh, uh, targets for us to uh, address over the, um, the coming months and year, uh, years. So there are really two fundamental questions that, that I sort of see. One is sort of this interplay between consumer genomics and uh, the, health, uh, the health system ecosystem, healthcare ecosystem. Um, what is that relationship, which we've heard a lot about? It obviously has evolved substantially in the past um, decade, and no doubt it is going to continue to evolve very substantially over the next one year, five year, 10 years, and that probably is the time frame that um, people will want to look at. A really interesting point, um, and, and if I take someone else's hot point for the day, too bad, I'm, I'm standing here. Um, the, uh, <laughs> Is, is this is the first, one of the first meetings where I've seen a recognition of the fact, um, which has slowly been coming along, but now uh, it has come up two or three or four times, um, that the changing ecosystem of healthcare, which in the old days um, was uh, Dr. Welby, um, uh, who would take care of you, and all healthcare either went through a primary care physician or all healthcare sort of went through, um, was pointed towards the local hospital local physician, local hospital, um, usually on um, a, a television show at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night. And that was the health ecosystem. Um, nowadays, we have health systems, we have individual hospitals, uh, but now uh, increasingly the consumers who are not going, not entering the ecosystem, not engaging with the ecosystem by going through a provider or through a clinic um, and certainly not, even, not through a health system. I know many people who haven't any idea what their health system is. They know the clinic they go to. They know who their provider is, usually, but the provider actually may change every time they go to that clinic. And they don't really know, unless they've had to go to the hospital for an event, they don't really know where, what health system that is. First of all, it changes frequently, um, um, and that's not their point of reference. So the, for them, the point of reference is, I'm going to directly engage with the health enterprise when I want to, when I need to, either through Google, um, uh, using my information, I'll find out what I need to find out, and I will then pick and choose the parts of the healthcare ecosystem as I need to be engaged or as I need them. And that's, this is, that's the next five or ten years that I see. Um, and it's not going to be what we started with ten years ago, where all paths um, until the beginning of um, uh, the con consumer genomics um, space, all paths ended up going through your provider and through um, um, health systems and healthcare. So that, that's sort of my um, idea um, um, from today. But I think we want to focus in this session um, on sort of where do we need to focus? Of all the things we've heard about, what do we need to focus on? What are the to-dos um, that will tee up not only the discussions for the roundtable tomorrow, um, but I think for any of us as we um, depart at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the session. So I'm going to, um, um, if you're all still with us, um, you'll recognize most of the people at the front, and if you don't, you should. Um, uh, we're joined um, uh, at the far end of the table um, by uh, Timothy Stenzel, uh, who uh, represents, um, but I'm sure he's going to say he's speaking as, a, as an individual. Uh, 
That's right. Um, he is here. He is employed by uh, the U.S. Uh, FDA, uh, director of the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health. Uh, he has a number of other um, titles as well, and I'm sure we'll hear about that. And, and so I'm actually going to start with um, uh, at the far end. Uh, because I, I'm going to invite you, I'm going to give you an extra minute to actually introduce yourself and what you okay. do. Everyone else only gets two or three minutes. I'm going to give you three or four minutes so you can introduce yourself. Uh, we'll get some ideas out on the table, and then we'll open it up to general um, questions and observations um, from the floor. So, Timothy? Okay, great. Um, Bennett, can you all hear me? So I've been at the agency for a little over a year. I'm a molecular um, pathologist as well as molecular geneticist, board certified in uh, anatomic and clinical pathology, received a board certification in clinical molecular genetics and in genetic uh, and molecular genetic pathology. Also did a couple of research uh, programs. One, my PhD was in bacterial genetics and um, um, a postdoc in human genetics. So. Um, a little bit of a genetic experience. So, um, you know, a little bit more about um, the agency. Obviously, we have authorized consumer genomic tests, and um, that was a big step for us, and we uh, took it very seriously. And when we do that, when, when we give any sort of authorization, when we review, we look at, you know, things like analytical and clinical validity. You know, is, is the test offering safe and effective, and ultimately, you know, what are the benefits and risks of the particular um, test or system that we're looking at? So in the case of consumer uh, genetics genomics, there are some different sort of risks that we looked at. And um, so, for example, we know that a, f a clinician, a physician may not be directly involved. And so understanding how the patient consumer um, interprets those findings is very important. So we do require user studies before we authorize that. So hopefully that's a good enough uh, summary, a little bit, very brief. And then I'll go into what I found most impactful today. So as usually is the case, and I, I get to participate in a number of these types of forums, whenever patients or consumers speak, I, I listen very carefully. Um, the agency is working very hard to incorporate uh, patient-reported outcomes in our, in our research and in our um, a review of applications. The use of real-world data and real-world evidence um, in packages is also important. So, uh, and I think we probably could all agree that getting more consumer um, patient input into this whole field and their interpretation their experience in, in, in this area can be very informative about how we move forward. So that, that's the thing that was most impactful to me. I was gratified to hear that, uh, at least for the two um, consumers that shared this morning, that the system worked as it was designed. Um, the safety features were in place. What I heard, though, at least from one person, Dorothy, was that, you know, are there ways that we can enhance the system so that uh, consumers, you know, particularly when they have a deleterious mutation, ha you know, have a little more support when that um, result is reported out. Some of that isn't in our purview at the FDA, um, but as a community, I think that's something very important to look at. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Dorothy, you're next. Um, thanks. So I think uh, I'm leaving today wishing that Everybody who had ever had a genetic test could have been here <laughs> or could sit through something like this. I think there's a, a real need for more education. I mean, that's kind of my biggest takeaway. I've learned so much today, and I've learned so much about the system, and I've learned so much about what I don't know about genetics. And um, I feel like it's a field that's moving so fast that we can't know. You know, people like me who are just on the ground, there's no way that we could know about it. but. Because we're engaging directly with these, um, you know, at-home genetic testing companies and asking them to tell us really important stuff about our genetics, I wish that we had better education and we knew more. And I don't know how that can happen. Uh, I think this is probably all part of the process when you have a new technology and when you have something this new. But um, that, that's my biggest takeaway, that this has been really educational. And I wish that 
there was a way people could know, uh, know more and understand more about genetics. Thank you, Bob. So I guess my, my major takeaway is, is um, that there are paradoxes and contradictions so that the entire system is not stable. It's not in equilibrium at all. Uh, what are the facts? The facts are, one, that people, are, people have a greater um, thirst for genetic information than is being satisfied by the traditional um, medical system. Two, there are logistical barriers to people being able to acquire that information. Three, if they ignore the medical establishment, but they have a strongly positive test of some sort, they want the medical establishment back on their side. Number four, we don't have enough person power to, uh, in the medical system to be able to provide that. I mean, a six-month wait list to go see a genetic counselor is just absurd. And five, um, people want an inexpensive test, but at the same time, someone has to pay that genetic counselor for the uh, great time and effort that he or she is spending uh, taking, care of those, taking care of the patient when they have a, a, a strongly positive result. So um, these, I, th I think, don't all mesh. That, that the, 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 so, the solution to this problem is going to require a multifactorial approach that attacks many of those inconsistencies and contra contradictions. And the last contradiction, the one that I find really quite interesting, is whether people's willingness to undergo genetic testing, in some sense, that willingness is inversely proportional to how serious they take the result, how seriously they take the result. Um, if, if it's a very serious issue, there may be a lot less willingness to take the test. Chairman? Um, thank you. I, um, today I've really been struck with the um, question of access and navigation and how sort of different um, systems and people and opportunities have allowed it at certain places and not others, um, and sort of how that then um, impacts a person's sense of empowerment. So, you know, as an example, when I am seeing patients and I will often, in the context of giving someone results that they have a, a, a mutation associated with increased risk of cancer, I'll say, you know, part of this experience is for us to help you um, change this information from feeling like something that's, you know, very troubling news to something that's empowering. And so we're going to work with you through that experience. So I've always had this sense of empowerment um, that is really critically important to find a way to assist the patient to make that transition um, and use this genetic information to be empowering. But what I was struck with today was, as an example, the direct to consumer, and you can you you're going to get you're going to navigate up front much more successfully. You're not going to wait. You're going to get this kit. You're going to send it in. But sort of then this devastating gap around re getting your results at 2 in the morning with a laptop and not knowing where to turn. And then sort of how do you navigate the system and how do you get in to be seen? So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is my reflection is that n this continuum of care has got a lot of access points and a lot of people trying to find pathways. but. Really, it's reflective of the overall health system. Maybe genetics isn't such an exception, but maybe genetics has given an opportunity for people to find alternative routes. And maybe we could continue to learn from that to try to, try to put something through together that's continuous. I think that's about education and counseling. I think we could do it. It's just a matter of financing it, as I said before. Shaniqua? Yes, hi. Um, so one of the issues I am uh, grappling with as a result of the conversations that we've had today has to do with the different systems. Are the uh, systems separate or the same? Um, is, where are the, the lines drawn between um, our medical system of testing and uh, the consumer environment? And we learned a lot about regulations for, that apply to federal research and to medical entities. Are, uh, when it comes to consumer data, is the data less safe? Are the data less safe, or um, or, or or not? What where um, in w in which cases are the data being shared and used in ways that are helpful and protected? And in which cases do we need to do more to um, to discuss protections? Um, a, a thought I had has to do with the discussion on law enforcement access. 
we know that law enforcement databases themselves seem to be separate in the sense and different in the sense that these are cases where they're, the DNA that is collected in these databases and the data come from marginalized and underrepresented populations when we think about CODIS and the National Law Enforcement Database. But when it comes to health services research and the positive impact that data collection, collection can have, then uh, we are missing representatives from underrepresented, um, underrepresented and minority populations. Um, how does this impact discussions about enrolling people from low resource and low income communities where they are more likely to feel like they do know something about DNA when it comes to law enforcement? Um, how do we approach those conversations and um, get to a point where we can begin to see a little bit more equity because there's a disparity in terms of which databases people are a part of. Um, what was my last thought? Um, let's see. <clears throat> I guess I'll stop there. I had a, I had another thought on that, but I'm sure it'll come to me later, so. <laughs> We have time. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Daniel? Sure. I'll start with an example of the FDA has put forth three genomic conditions which they consider a tier one for healthcare providers to identify and diagnose in individuals, that being hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, Lynch syndrome, and then familial hypercholesterolemia. And we know that we're doing a fairly awful job in that realm right now. So when you look at women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer, all of them should have that test, but yet we've seen data that it's in the 30% range. And so to kind of transition what we're doing in the medical setting and use the direct-to-consumer um, statistics that we've seen today of the number of individuals having testing as an opportunity that these individuals have been inoculated or introduced to the idea of genetics and that we can help build those bridges to come back into the medical system to use that data to confirm it, to kind of take their health to the next level, I think is a great opportunity that we all have here. I think that those consumers need tools both on the pretest side by evaluating their family history, determining which tests might be best for them, even in the direct to consumer space but also reconciling that with their wants. So although they might have a striking family history of, you know, let's just say cancer, their wants might be related to um, what foods am I allergic to, you know, so there has to be some reconciliation there as well. And then also the opportunity for tools in the post-test setting as well to help those individuals uh, learn about their genetics and keep informed over time. <laughs>